Yeah, all my hung. So uh, tonight we uh, don't have lots of time. So uh, if we could uh, do seven line prayer to Gurimshe and then the Heart Sutra, that will be just fine. So I'm sorry everybody doesn't have uh, seven line prayer, but uh, we do all have Heart Sutra. Lots of times when the Lama is giving just a kind of talk, uh, you you would just do seven line prayer, just do uh, Heart Sutra. You don't do all the prayers, particularly if it's like an ongoing talk. You know, it's like so. I'm just assuming that everyone's been here the whole time. We're just on retreat or living in retreat center or monastery, so. Uh, you've already done tons of prayers because you've already done your daily practice, right? So we'll just do uh, uh, three seven-line prayers. Um, and when we do a new um, booklet uh, like this, then um, we can include it. This is a shortened version, actually, of what we've done in the past. <laughs> So it looks like Dirk's way ahead of things. So I appreciate that. So uh, he's presenting uh, Seven Line Prayer and uh, the famous statue of Guru Mshay where he said, it looks just like me. So uh, let's get started. Dirk, you can start. Oh, what am I doing? at the middle. Nampula Yatsin Jogi No Pune Amajune Shesuja Ordu Kandra Ma Uko Keki Jesu Daktu Ki Jinji Lakshir Seksu Se Guru Pama Siddhi Morgan Yogi Nun Johnson Amage Sadampo Yatsin Chogi No Prudne Ama 
does Heart Sutra. I recite the Heart Sutra. Okay. <clears throat> oh no, I'll do this. Okay. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, Arya Bhagavati, Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra, a prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear, at one time, Bhagwan was dwelling on mass of vultures mountain on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagwan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara. How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharavadiputra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element and so on, and up to including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputta, therefore, because there is no attainment, Bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. 
Hayata gate gate paragate parasangate bodhis. Yata gate gate paragate parasangate bodhisaha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration, committed the bodhisattva mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharavadi Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety along with the world of gods, demons, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. This completes the Arya Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra. Hmm. So um, I'm here with a few Dharma students. They're, they're all being incredibly um, good students sitting apart and wearing masks. So uh, I'm, the, I'm the only one who's unsafe. <laughs> they're quite a ways away, you know, so like that. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so can people uh, hear me okay? Yeah, all right. So... Um, uh, Monday night is part of Buddha Dharma study course, um, and the title for today is uh, The Tenets and Logic <clears throat> and uh, Debate. <clears throat> um, the tenet systems, very simply, that we've been looking at are um, the two. Uh, Hinayana systems and the two Mahayana systems, these basic uh, building blocks. But um, when we talk about tenets in a broad way, uh, we're talking about what the essence of the various uh, vehicles are, what the essence of the various teachings are. So uh, in our tradition, we can't just stop, um, you know, with the four schools. Um, we also have to talk about uh, what are the tenets of Tantra and what are the tenets of Mahamudra and Dzogchen. Uh, and in this case, you know, uh, we can't go into detail here, but uh, for my close students, the ones that uh, go on retreat and do the regular practices, we need to know the essence of each practice. So, uh, if we say, okay, I'm uh, doing uh, this Tantra practice, uh, then are we doing Anatara Tantra or doing Kriya Tantra or Charya Tantra? Uh, if we're saying we're doing uh, uh, the Mahayoga Tantras uh, from Nyingma point of view, what, what are we doing, you know? So it's our job to be able to uh, concisely put together the essence of what we're doing, not just for, for ourselves, but for others. So there uh, is a lot of confusion in uh, what we sometimes call t Tibetan Buddhism, because the Tibetans um, decided that they wanted to preserve every piece of Buddhism that they could find, uh, you know, whether it was from uh, the southern part of the continent or whether it was from China or India or Persia or whatever. And they wanted to put it all together in a coherent system. What's not frequently brought out, however, is that um, the uh, different uh, vehicles, the different styles from 
contrary to Dzogchen, to uh, individual liberation practice or yoga chara practice or whatever, can have very different approaches. And this is, can be a very confusion for um, not just Western students, but was uh, obviously also very confusing at times uh, to Tibetans. And it has been the source of a lot of writing and realization and debate. So uh, when we're talking about tenants in a broad way, um, we're not just talking about the individual tenant schools and the text that I've asked uh, people to read over the last several months. Uh, just for tonight, I, I want to let people know that uh, we'd also have to, uh, in, our, in our temple here, in our lineage, we, we also have to be able to say, well, what, what actually are we doing when we're doing uh, Anatara Yoga Tantra? Or what do we think we're doing when we're reading uh, the Ganges Mahamudra? Or what are we doing when we're reading uh, Gurimshe or um, Bangchampa or um, Patra Rimshe uh, or Jigme Lingpa? What are we doing when we're reading Dzogchen texts? Um, is it just uh, saying the same thing over? Uh, are they coming from different perspectives? And if so, uh, can they be integrated or not? So uh, last time I spoke, which I think was a while ago, I um, drew people's attention to uh, uh, a talk, a uh, transcribed talk uh, given by the Dalai Lama many years ago, I think maybe at the University of Virginia where he was talking about the union of uh, the four schools. I don't know, maybe some people remember what the title of the talk was. It's too late tonight. But um, that would be an example of where uh, uh, President Dalai Lama very adroitly was able to bring out what the uh, essential differences and commonalities uh, of the different approaches of Dharma are. So. His other books are uh, very good at doing uh, this too. Um, uh, I haven't given people other readings, but um, of course, if people want to read uh, Dujim uh History of the Nyingma School, that would also give you much insight. But uh, since the Dalai Lama's book, uh, his lecture is very accessible in the book, Kindness, Clarity, and uh, Insight, then um, it should be access accessible to most of us. So I'll stop there. I, I have to look at my computer over here to go, am I making any sense? <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> oh. Sometimes people think that um, uh, teachers can just say the truth and people instantly become realized. Um, that's never been the case. Uh, we, we know uh, that uh, it was necessary for Guru Rinpoche to travel uh, to a monastery and uh, the monastery almost lost its divine or uh, regal favor. But uh, fortunately, Guru Rinpoche was able to debate and uh, win the debate. And <clears throat> I'm putting that out because even though uh, we're aiming, so to speak, for direct uh, non-conceptual immediate yogic experience, um, I don't know a teacher yet in the Buddhist tradition who hasn't used the medium of the intellect and of speech. So one of the characteristics of Dharma particularly Buddha Dharma, is that uh, the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, the Mahasiddhas, uh, are extremely um, articulate. And uh, I'm hoping uh, that uh, in our tradition we can produce some articulate uh, uh, Mahasiddhas. Don't you think that would be a good idea? So... <clears throat> The um, different traditions uh, uh, 
in Mahayana have uh, a very strong uh, unifying theme um, around wisdom. Uh, it's used in different ways and uh, wisdom isn't always the translation. Uh, sometimes wisdom is the translation for prajna, uh, sometimes the translation uh, for jhana is wisdom. Um, on retreat, while I was gone two weeks, uh, I started getting back into reading uh, Keith Dalman. And uh, every time I read Keith Dalman, uh, his translations like of um, uh, Fly to the Garuda or his uh, Zogchen uh, translations of uh, Long Champa, I, I kind of become a bit of his convert, you know. He's very, but then I would read um, uh, Lama Tony Duff translation, and I'd go, "Well, it's got to be that way." <laughs> so uh, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, the practices of um, Manjushri um, are practiced in uh, most of the uh, uh, Mahayana schools and from a tantric point of view also is an extremely uh, wrathful form of Manjushri uh, Yamantaka, the death destroyer. So uh, I've taken that um, empowerment uh, from a number of teachers most recently, uh, Dalai Lama and um, uh, that was in Long Beach uh, a number of years ago. Uh, I was able to uh, read the Dalai Lama as he walked into the, he's really incredible. <laughs> he just kind of, I knew what kind of elevator and where what hotel was. So there were a couple of us that said, okay, we're just going to wait here. And guess what? He emerged from the elevator and we were just standing there with our katas and he stopped and said hi and off he went. You know, people said, we didn't know you could do that. And I said, well, you can. I don't know if you can do that anymore. But in any case, at that uh, empowerment, um, I uh, uh, said, well, if you're going to do the training, uh, do it. Uh, if you're not going to do it, fuck it. And I'm just saying that, a little shocking maybe to some of you, but I, I was sitting next to Deb Dietz, the Sangha member, and I knew exactly what he said, but I just kind of wanted to check. I said, well, did Dalai Lama just say, fuck it? And she said, yep. <laughs> so very, like, people always uh, see uh, Dalai Lama as being, um, of course, in the media, very nice. But uh, uh, he was doing that impairment uh, very uh, fierce, uh, no nonsense, even though it was a large impairment. Um, so, uh, my, we don't know when we'll see Dalai Lama again, but people said, wouldn't it be nice if the Dalai Lama was my personal teacher? And I go, I don't think you'd have a good time at all. <laughs> He'd be very good on you. So, <clears throat> but, um, uh, at some point, I uh, promised Dirk that I would uh, give some teachings on um, uh, Nipam Rinpoche, uh, and uh, who had a particularly strong relationship with Manjushri, as did uh, Lama Sankapa. Um, and uh, you know, I'm looking forward to that. Um, the text that I'd be teaching from is uh, a beacon of certainty. And, um, uh, you know, I look forward to doing that. It's a big task, so I have to reread uh, all the commentaries um, and uh, go forward uh, from there. So it may be um, at least another month before I would start mentioning that. Would that be okay with you guys at some point? Yeah. Um, uh, 
And the way Mipa Rinpoche was uh, kind of an auto dictate, he, he um, uh, a little bit like um, uh, you know, he would just pick things up and would write on all the different uh, styles and tenets and um, was a, a formidable uh, debater um, uh, with the other schools and a formidable writer. So uh, probably, I, I don't know, I'm just saying kind of absolutely, but um, probably his writings form kind of the most uh, widely used, uh, you know, contemporary writings uh, in uh, most Nyingma monasteries, you know, like that. <clears throat> so when I say tenants, um, it's not just these different um, uh, uh, yogas that uh, we should know about, but um, my goal for people in the Buddha Dharma study program and for everyone is uh, we should be able to articulate some of the uh, essential doctrines and differences of uh, the leading lineages in Tibet, right? So uh, over the years, I've met various clever people. But so, but uh, uh, usually the cleverness subsides when I say, would you please let me know the distinction between the Gilak Mahamudra uh, as a, through the Kargu school, but and the difference between the Shank, Shankpa Kargu approach. <laughs> they don't know what to say. <laughs> maybe maybe Lama Tony Duff would know. I bet. <laughs> but we should know that you know we instead of saying well I'm this and that's right, um, that carries absolutely no weight with me. Just saying well I belong to this group. This is the teacher, this is the lineage. So they're right, that that actually carries nothing with me, right? So um, we, we should be able to articulate um, what uh, our fundamental ideas are and realizations and be able to uh, know what other people uh, have said and um, how they uh, are different and the same. So that's the real uh, Rime approach. So I'm saying this in a long detailed thing so that those people studying tenants don't think like, well, you're just done by looking at the four uh, Hinayana Mahayana schools that it has to go further than that. And that um, you can't just say my, my school is right, but I don't know what it is. And, or we can't get by and just saying, um, everybody is basically saying the same thing if they just realize it. I'm sorry, you can't get off the hook that way. Can people still hear me? My voice is a little, yeah. <clears throat> so this is a, a quite ambitious uh, plan, um, but uh, the teachers that uh, brought here uh, seem to enjoy the idea. Um, so uh, we will do that. Um, and my prayer is that we can have uh, visiting teachers from Asia for, um, from America coming in person sometimes next year. What do you think? We say yes. Yeah. <clears throat> in the past, Many years ago, uh, when you were practicing on Watt Avenue, um, uh, I had a great variety of teachers come, some of my Nyingma and Kargu teachers. Um, and uh, it was too early for everybody because people didn't have the, um, the structure to be able to appreciate it. So it became like kind of a, one teacher would come and everybody go, yeah, that's right. They're right. <laughs> and then if I brought in a teacher from an, another lineage, they'd go, yeah, they're right. You know, that other person was wrong. They're right. You know, and I go, no, that's called serial monogamy. 
right? You just date and then you dump them and then <laughs> go on to your next date. Uh, we're not gonna, we don't do it that way, right? Um, so to learn how to appreciate um, uh, the different approaches uh, uh, without just going like, well, that was wrong, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. Uh, when we're studying tenets, um, the idea is they're, they're all correct in a given situation and for a given audience from a given point of view, right? So um, that uh, is a very we may or, or non-biased approach. <clears throat> so where does logic come in? Logic will come in when we uh, uh, start um, reading Dignaga and Dharmakirti. Um, uh, the logic and epistemology go along at the same time. Epistemology is how we know things. Uh, logic is the formal way how we must know things. So uh, I hope some people in the audience um, hang on uh, through that uh, period. Um, over uh, the last two weeks, um, the nice part about traveling is uh, you get to go to different bookstores. <laughs> so uh, I picked up an elementary, well, not really a college uh, textbook on critical thinking written by um, two professors from Chico State. It's not Buddhist logic, but um, I want to emphasize that if we actually even study some Western logic, um, we will benefit from that. So uh, as a complete nerd, I took PhD studies in logic. Um, and I, f I found out one very important thing that I do not think usually logically. Uh, there's, uh, the, uh, the textbook was something about critical thinking, but a Western book that I do recommend to people um, as a warm up is called Logic in Everyday Life. Has anybody ever read that? Well, if you find it in a used bookstore or on Amazon, um, it's my approach to logic, even with Buddhist logic. The point of uh, the logic uh, from Dharma point of view is always liberation, and it has to do with uh, everyday life. It's extremely humbling to realize that most of the decisions we make and the opinions we have have actually we are not able to defend logically at all we don't know what we're saying we are sophists do people know what a sophist was during the time of socrates it was someone who used rhetoric um, and uh, false reasoning to get someone to agree to an outcome so uh, with the Buddha Dharma study program, my hope is that uh, learning uh, Dharma logic uh, and epistemology will enable us to have actually uh, logic in everyday life and discussions that actually make sense. But it's, it's daunting. So preparing for this class, I thought, if you can't read through basic, a little bit of basic Western logic, or if you want it, I don't know, there's probably some Wikipedia article on symbolic logic or Aristotelian logic um, for the um, philosophic geeks out there, of which I'm one, then you could check that out. Um, where Buddhist logic isn't, totally different than Aristotelian logic. Um, maybe a question for the audience is, um, you should know this if you read uh, Agarjuna, um, can something both be, uh, can you have a both and? 
you know, can can you say, well, something is both and. Okay, I'm getting one response from our audience here in the temple. For New Agers, we always like to say, well, I'm not stuck in either the binary. I think people or things can be both black and white, up and down at the same time. Can they be both black and white, up and down, the same time, the same place? Yeah. No, well, they can't. Um, luckily, I'm seeing a few shaking heads. <clears throat> they can when you're doing drugs. <laughs> but we're not going to do drugs. <laughs> so um, these kind of basic things uh, are necessary to clear the path um, to realization and truth. So uh, I mentioned in this class before, um, we want our practice to go from experience to insight, to realization, to truth. We want to be the truth. We just don't want to see the truth. We want to be the truth. So we have experiences, but unless they're investigated, they don't turn to insights. Unless the insights are stabilized, they're not going to turn into realizations. Unless the realizations uh, are expanded and uh, dedicated, they won't turn to truth. So uh, the tenant system uh, is geared actually towards not just figuring out, um, but uh, becoming the truth. So if we actually think of people as the truth. So that is the guru principle actually. So. Uh, you think, oh, okay, I see uh, the Buddha, I see the truth at the same time. So the tenet system is made to us from a, a realization point of view to not just see the truth or realize the truth, but uh, be the truth. So how are we doing for time? Let's see. So I'd like to stop here with a little bit of uh, questions and uh, uh, discussions. Um, I see a lot of people have signed up and I'm very gratified. Um, I don't know if I can hear them. Can they hear them if they speak up? I guess you unmute yourself and you go for it. Is that how we do it? <clears throat> I don't think I'm the one that unmutes them, am I? No. <laughs> so. Hey, Lama, this is Karen. I have a question. Can yes. you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, you always do that right at the end. You kind of throw a zinger out there and you threw it, the zinger about um, not just seeing or realizing the truth, but being the truth. Does that, do you mean, be, does that encompass the truth of your experience? Is that what you're talking about or is it bigger than that? Um, I think at the time where, when we say being the truth, uh, it's somewhat on the level of uh, Mahamudra Dzogchen, because um, uh, it's like someone sees, uh, we're totally congruent with uh, who we are in our knowledge. So someone, uh, what we say and what we do uh, and who we are is uh, all congruent. So we'd say to somebody, they, they, they aren't just nice people or loving, but they're love. You know, when I say that person, I, I see love. I see. You know, this is how it is with the really great teachers. Uh, you, you don't just kind of think, well, they're really smart or something. You feel like you're in the presence of love and wisdom. You don't feel like, so um, that's why I kind of like um, Keith Dowman's translation of uh, um, 
Rigpa as a presence. Did I get that right, Dirk? Yeah, he likes that translation, you know. So um, isn't just that you've had an insight or realization or experience, but that um, you, you've become that. So uh, that's, the, that's the funny part about Dzogchen Mahamudra. It, it uses terminology that uh, we'd see in Hinayana and Mahayana and even Tantra, um, but uh, it's used in a completely different way. And that's why we need to study the tenets, like how is it used in a different way? So when I say being the truth, uh, that's a little different than just knowing the truth. Okay, thank you. Like the tree's the tree, right? The tree's not knowing itself to be a tree. What do you think, right? The mountain's the mountain. It's not knowing itself to be a mountain. So it can't be anything other than it is um, like that. So that's an interesting part about um, what we'd call certainty. Um, going a little ahead to um, Nipam Rinpoche is like, uh, you know, at that point you you can't help but but be that way. We say that in a negative way. <laughs> you know, that person can't help but be a jerk. Right, you know, um, but uh, we want to be at that point. Yeah, we're being it. We, we can't help it. <clears throat> cats can't help, but cats are are good um, practitioners. They're not trying to be other than cat, right? <laughs> So I'm trying to give a little overview tonight because it's been a while since we talked. <clears throat> uh, what's the question? I can't read it. <clears throat> uh, that's a good question because a lot of times when people read about interdependence, uh, they think that um, that means uh, that we've we've got both and uh, that we kind of can have it all, right? So <clears throat> um, that's why sometimes uh, uh, relativity sound is kind of sometimes a little misleading from English point of view, but uh, one way to think about uh, interdependence is just like left and right on the roadway, right? Um, it, they're not going to be, the left isn't going to be the right, and the right isn't going to be the left. They're relative to each other. So you, you really want people driving on the right-hand side of the road in America, right? On the right side, correct? So we're we're not saying that uh, you know there isn't a road. We have a road, right? So uh, the road doesn't have to be both the road and not the road at the same time, does it? No. But uh, when we're talking about uh, phenomena, uh, in this case, phenomena are a uh, certain kind of phenomena are arising. Uh, in relationship to each other. But the relationship doesn't mean that uh, right is left and left is right. If you want to explore relativity, um, you know, if someone's uh, owing you a debt, you, you don't want them to say, well, it's all relative, so I'll just give you $5 if I owe you 20, right? You want, you want the $20, even though, of course, Money itself is a relative situation, right? I don't know. Is that helpful? Maybe not. <laughs> but a strong um, piece of, uh, if I could use the term spiritual materialism, that term Purimshe coined, um, a strong misunderstanding of Tantra and Buddha Dharma in general is that, you know, we can have our cake and eat it too, right? get to have all the passions in the enlightenment at the same time. 
we get to have it all. We don't have to give anything up. <clears throat> if you know someone that's accomplished that, I'd like to meet them. <laughs> uh, it always means that if we're going to drive on the right-hand side of the road, we can't simultaneously be driving on the left. We're both driving on the road, though. That's comforting, isn't it? So uh, we can get along with others because we recognize that on the way back, we'll be driving on their side of the road, right? We'll be on their side. So it's relative. <clears throat> However, uh, some approaches uh, point out that, of course, uh, uh, Partitya Samapada, Shunyata, uh, interdependence, whatever term, uh, that uh, itself has to be taken in context. So uh, we, uh, particularly in Mahamud and Dzogchen, we may be talking about some things that uh, don't fall into the standard way of talking about um, interdependence or relativity. <clears throat> So uh, from a certain points of view, if we uh, tell our teacher, well, uh, uh, absolute truth is emptiness or uh, interdependence, um, we may be given a smile, but uh, from an, another point of view, uh, that may not uh, suffice. <laughs> Okay. I, I can't see questions on the screen here. Um, I'll just unmute myself. Sorry. I'm getting used to online etiquette. Hello. Okay. Long. <laughs> um, so correct me if I'm wrong, obviously, but we're supposed to kind of accept our relative selves along with the ultimate truth of our Buddha nature. Is that correct? Um, by you know, to uh, so when by relative self you mean the um, understanding that uh, when we say I'm going to the store, that's uh, only consists conventionally. Is that what you mean? In a way. Yes, but like our conventional self exists right now. It's like the forms our human bodies are in at the very moment. But we also have a Buddha nature which existed before that. It's going to exist after that, correct? Uh, I didn't hear the last part. It got a little mumbled. Sorry, is my mic a little bit off? Okay. Okay. Um, but we have a Buddha nature that exists right now as well. And it existed before that. It'll exist after that, correct? It'll exist after what? Our relative physical bodies die and decay. <clears throat> so um, I'm just being kind of difficult tonight, of course, because Sukuni is a professional. So um, we, we do have to um, be careful how we use and clarify. This is why we study like, well, what do you mean by exists? You know, we have to be very careful about that. So, um, are we really saying the Buddha nature or even the relative self exists the same way the internet exists or chairs or tables exist? Probably not, right? Yeah. So uh, in what way does the Buddha nature exist, would you say? Ultimately. Uh, so when we say something ultimately exists, what are we saying? It's, it's the, I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's the truth of our existence, what we're aiming for. It's what drives us. Well, uh, we can say a little bit, you know, so uh, maybe just going back to simple. So uh, when we say uh, emptiness is uh, the absolute, Ultimate, what, what do you mean by that? 
that nothing exists conventionally, nothing exists independent of itself. Everything exists with, like independent with another thing. So it's impossible to find the ultimate. Is it not so? No. How would you find it? Meditating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and debate and discussion and definitions, yeah. Epistemology like this, that I like the way we're doing it. <clears throat> so uh, there, there are different ways, you know, of talking about, you know, just when we use words like absolute and relative um, professionally, um, we, you know, when we're talking from like just a simple my Dimakan approach is, is we're going to have, in a, particularly a Gelug Madhyamaka approach, we're going to have a little spin on that way. And then if we, uh, you know, talking from a yoga chara point of view, we're going to have a little different. Or, you know, uh, a yoga chara Madhyamaka approach, like Chandrakshida, who, you know, was present with Guru Rimshay in Tibet for some day, that's going to be a little different too, right? So it's going to be a little different. So we're talking about Buddha nature from uh, Asanga Maitreya's Uttara Tantra Shastra, uh, Yu Lama. So it's going to have a little different feel to it, won't it? So this is why we're, you know, training in this way is that we we want to get very specific about when we're using words like ultimate or relative or uh, conventional, you know, what is the context? You know, what are we bringing to it? Because um, uh, one degree off uh, will make a big difference in a long journey, right? Yeah. Like that. Um, so, uh, and, you know, just even going to like a Mahamudra Dzogchen approach, uh, like uh, Mahamudra, like uh, Eighth Karmapa, or even uh, what we've read a lot with Dandi's Mahamudra. Um, uh, you can't say it's like this, right? So we say it's like space, but if you say it's like this, you can't say it. So uh, when we're talking from these uh, different points of view, um, Sometimes it, uh, we would get in trouble if we'd say the ultimate exists, right? Even though we can't find mind, we're using mind all the time, right? Can't find it. Can you find your mind? If you can find your mind, uh, please let me know. Uh, <laughs> then we'll publish it, you know, but actually you can't find it. <clears throat> but we're using it, can't find it. So sometimes it's like the eye, we're using the eye, but actually if there were no mirrors, we'd never see our own eye, would we, right? So uh, when we're talking Buddha nature, um, generally we're gonna be talking in a uh, little bit of yoga chara point of view, right? So, uh, if we're talking a yoga chara point of view, then we'll, we'll probably be talking uh, at least the three natures, right? So that, that gets complicated, a little bit more complicated. I don't think, um, uh, I, I always like being corrected and it's late for my old bones, but I don't think Nagarjuna mentions Buddha nature once. I don't think so. Yeah, I'm checking my other scholar here, Dirk, he's shaking his head too. So you let me know, maybe we're wrong, you know, if the guardian mentions Buddha nature, but I don't think he says it once. No Buddha nature. We don't need it. <laughs> That's what's interesting, why it's fun to learn tenets, because, um, you know, 
maybe we don't need it. You know, I was saying the Buddha nature, and it feels really great because I've been reading, after reading Madhyamaka material, I didn't have people read um, uh, the Tara Tantra Shastra about Buddha nature. And, and I think a few people got really depressed because they went to a nihilistic side. Like, it would be like going to somebody um, who's invited us to a party and uh, we say, well, what do you want us to bring? Um, and they go, no, no, you don't need to bring anything. And then we're kind of disappointed because we feel like, you know, we, we ought to make some dish. Can we, can we bring the cinnamon rolls or, you know, can we bring something to drink or, you know, and they say, no, 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 don't bring anything. Which, which would you guys rather be? Would you rather go to the party and somebody says, don't bring anything, you know, just, just show up. You don't need to bring anything. Or would it feel more comfortable if they said, um, uh, just bring the cinnamon rolls or, um, you know, just bring something interesting to talk about? Which one would feel more satisfying? Does anybody want to volunteer? <laughs> I think it would definitely be more satisfying to have a sense of what would be appropriate and know what to bring. Like, would it be kind of anxiety producing? Like, shit, I, you know, they don't want me to bring anything. I've just got to like wing it like that. Yeah. Or maybe it's a game, you know, Oh, don't bring anything. You know, it's like Southern, right. You know, don't bring anything. It's fine. And it's like, Oh, get that bozo. He forgot. He didn't know. Yeah, everyone else brought something. Right. You know, like that. okay. That's a good answer, yeah. Is there anybody that would go, I'm relieved, you know, like I don't have to bring anything, you know? Well, I'd be fine either way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, if, if, if they want to throw a party and provide everything, that's fine. If they want us to participate, that's fine. I, I don't care. <laughs> It's nice not to have an agenda, you know, going in. So that's one of the things, yes, we, we look at um, with tenants uh, and by saying tenants, you know, really going into what, what are we bringing to the situation, right? So uh, this is an important part um, in uh, Western existentialist thinking and also Western psychology, like, well, we're talking about these true things uh, but, uh, you know, what are we actually bringing into the situation? So, uh, what are our expectations on unconscious expectations? So, um, a big part of teaching, particularly, um, from the point of view of Tantra and, uh, Dzogchen is that, um, uh, you, it's, uh, difficult to have uh, expectations. And uh, if you do bring expectations, they'll be left at the door <laughs> like that. So then how do we prepare? Do you bring the expectations and surrender them at the door like you'd leave your sword at the door? Um, or do you try to somehow have no expectations? Which sounds better? I thought you can't have no expectations. You said there's unconscious expectations. I mean, I said sometimes there are unconscious expectations. I mean, isn't don't we almost always have that? <laughs> Well, usually we do have expectations. We do. So, um, but I do think, I'm just being a little normative here, I do think it's possible to have no expectations. But I'm not sure it's possible to produce. I think it might be impossible to produce no expectations. So that's why uh, in Mahamudra and Dzogchen, we, we talk about... Um, it can't be produced. It seems like uh, it seems like we should be able to somehow uh, go through a cause and effect uh, training 
and somehow produce or uncover um, the situation, right? Uh, in fact, sometimes it's talked about in Mahamudra Sokhtan, we can uncover, but um, that's got to be metaphoric, right? It, um, it seems like if I've been through an experience a few different times and all the outcomes of that experience were neutral or positive or not really um very negative and i'm in a you know a relaxed mental state then i can walk into that situation and not really care and if that's the case i'm probably much more open to whatever experience is going to come but if i try to ahead of time put myself in that mental state and i've never experienced it before it does seem like there's other afflictive emotions that come up that obscure my ability to actually understand what's happening and to participate on that mm. level. Mm. So you brought up an important point. Um, is uh, When we're talking, uh, when we use the term mental state, we have to really define that. That we could spend a lot of time on. So when we're talking about um, uh, experiences, we're talking about valid experiences. Uh, we're, are we talking actually about mental states? So right now, for example, uh, we could say uh, we know just using arithmetic, two plus two is four. Um, do you agree? Uh, is that a mental state? Doesn't feel like a mental state. Anybody want, anybody says it's a mental state? Is it true? Let's just even say conventionally. We make all kinds of decisions based on like arithmetic. I know I do. When Sabrina sends me to the store, I, I want to get five apples, not four. <clears throat> So um, I'm trying not to give a scattered um, approach uh, or lecture tonight, but uh, for people to get some experiential sense of doing tenants. Tenants are things that we actually can uh, verify and stand by and understand. And it's difficult because we use a lot of terminology all the time without exploring uh, you know, what it actually means to us and how we uh, can use it in daily life, uh, let alone use it uh, during special experiences. So uh, I'm hoping that people um, will respond when I send out some uh, questions for a short essay uh, this month. I hope that um, uh, we don't have to spend uh, as much time wondering what's going to happen to the election. <laughs> I know I'll spend a little time thinking there'll be some strangeness over the next few months, but I'm hoping that people can um, uh, concentrate on uh, Dharma practice um, in spite of COVID and the elections and um, whatever else. So, <clears throat> uh, Please uh, read diligently and, and meditate diligently. Um, but uh, I have to say, you know, of course, we, we all emphasize meditation, but uh, there's uh, a famous uh, text document called uh, uh, Realization Without Meditation, right? Anybody want to say who? I don't have the, quite the right title there. What's what's the actual? What's the right title, Dirk? Buddhahood without meditation. That's right. By Dujim Lingpa. Yeah. So I'm very fond of Dujim Lingpa, 
Bidu Lingpa was, um, uh, tell a few stories before we close. <laughs> Look, um, Bidu Lingpa was a nobody and um, kind of uh, uh, just started um, uh, saying things and uh, uh, discovering uh, truths, but um, uh, many of his colleagues and friends uh, for a long time, held him in uh, deep skepticism, right? Um, because he didn't come through an established uh, line and monastery and of course was associated with, but really kind of a nobody, um, but became uh, a major part of uh, the Renaissance in uh, Tibet um, and became recognized as a Tertan uh, treasure discoverer. Um, uh, and uh, I like uh, us to, uh, in some sense, emulate Dujum Lingpa's uh, life because uh, right away, let's let's just figure we'll never be famous, okay? And let's just figure we'll uh, come to some realization and liberation and truth, and. Um, Everybody will think we haven't changed at all, okay? <laughs> so, you know, like a shit detector question, Koan, that I like asking people is, would it be okay if you became enlightened and no one recognized it? <laughs> and some people's their face drops. Well, what's the point then? Yeah. So, um, let's save ourselves a lot of time, you know. Uh, Dujum Lingpa continued to uh, speak his truth and gradually uh, became respected and admired by Jungpin Kunchul and um, the different teachers of the time. But uh, let our practice and our speech, um, uh, you know, come from nowhere, right? You know, just be a nobody, okay? And then from that point of view, we're, we don't think I want to be a great scholar, a great Mahasiddha, a great abbot or something, just um, do the practice and the rest will follow, don't you think? So do we have any last minute questions, comments and complaints before we end today? <clears throat> yeah. Well, isn't it okay to, to want to ha attain some of these realizations along the path? <laughs> yes, we do want realizations and liberations to benefit others. But uh, wouldn't it be nice if we benefited others and uh, everything was, uh, no one knew where it was coming from and no one knew who we were? Okay. Wouldn't that be lovely? Yeah, that's you know? fine. That's fine with me. They, we give, yeah, we give, we say things that are truthful and people still think we're an idiot or, or we <laughs> go into a room and no one recognizes us. Uh, wouldn't that be lovely? You know? But, but you uh, say that like that hasn't happened before. <laughs> <laughs> but we really want to be liberated from the tyranny of uh, praise and blame and gain and loss and pleasure and pain and being recognized and being unrecognized, right? Mm -hmm. So let's overcome those dualities. And uh, I think Dujim Lingpa and um, uh, definitely uh, Dujim Rinpoche of the 20th century was just like that. Like you could just walk up and say hi, you know, like that. Okay, so uh, we should do closing, closing prayers, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> should I broadcast them? I guess so. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat>
the merits of these virtuous actions may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful, Genrezi, Tenzin Gatsa. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill the, all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losan, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions for the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Abhulakitashara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars, Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of snowy land sages, Losang Drakpa, I make request at your holy feet. Should I make that announcement? So what time? Uh, this Thursday uh, at 7.30, Councilor uh, is uh, giving a special teaching for us. Um, so uh, I, I really want you to tune in, at least, you know, tune in, you know, um, it's very special that uh, he's, um, uh, you know, taking the time to do this, uh, especially at my request. And um, uh, what's he teaching on? Oh, philosophy of Tundra. so absolutely essential. Um, uh, I really uh, hope that Councilor Mche is able to visit Sacramento next year. Uh, uh, he's very smart and very playful, and we've hit it off, you know, and he's very energetic, so, uh, and young. <laughs> so I want him around for a long time uh, and, uh, you know, appreciate his breadth of teaching. So he has so many things going on. Uh, but uh, with, uh, you know, prayers and aspirations, um, uh, the swans will come to the lake. So uh, it's rare to be able to get uh, a teacher to specifically um, take aside the time uh, who has so many duties. Um, and uh, I think, uh, are we able to ask questions during that time? So. Sometimes, so sometimes he has it open to questions. So um, you should show up and just ask a question, right? So um, in asking Dharma questions, don't try to be clever, please. Just, you know, just say, I, you know, like, I don't understand what emptiness is or whatever. What is time? I don't understand. You know, just ask any question. Just be humble. You don't need to be like, Impressing by like da 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 da. What do you think, Rinpoche? No, just say I I don't know what I'm doing here, but what's the question? You know, I have a question for you like that. And uh, he's most compassionate and um, um, like that. So, comes uh, Rinpoche. Hey. Um, yes. Oh, Lama, I was going to ask about the seven. Isn't he doing the seven point mind training? That's on the website, but King Sir Rinpoche, or is that somebody else? Uh, I he, he is also doing that, but he's not doing that uh, specifically for us. That's a different set of teachings. But the mm -hmm. one that he does on Thursday, he's doing specifically for us. And, you know, when only a few of us show up, it's kind of embarrassing, actually. That well, I tried to go to the one. I mean, we have it listed on the website as being on Mondays and, or Wednesdays and Sundays and Wednesdays. And I went onto the website on Sunday and used that zoom meeting code and there was nobody there so and i waited uh, at least um, yeah he, Greg, he's had it's a, a holiday right now in nepal so he's currently on break sorry okay. for interrupting Dirk. yeah 
<laughs> well, I figured it was something like that. But so I just wanted to know, is he continuing to do that? Will that start again? And does anyone know when the real date is that he's going to start doing that again? He's going to be starting it shortly. He'll be sending out a flyer soon and it'll be posted to the Lion's Door website like as, as soon as it there's information on it. At what yeah. website? Lion's Door. Oh, okay. The calendar, yeah. Because it's on there yeah. now, so it's on there every week. So it says it's going on, but then, like I said, Sunday it didn't happen. So I'm just curious, when is the real date that he's actually going to be there? Well, we he's really that? he's really busy, and he has, like, a really heavy schedule going on because it's a holiday season in Nepal right now. So, And there's COVID going on over there. So as soon as the schedule gets set up, you know, we'll post the flyer to the website. Okay. Well, then I'll, I guess I'll watch for that. So there's going to be no more of those meetings until this flyer shows up? Until it's scheduled, yes. Okay. But we're having a case where Bache is talking this Thursday just for Lions for Dharma Center. Okay. Well, I just mean it is scheduled on the calendar. So my point is, is that it is already scheduled. So that's what I'm trying I, I'll, to figure out. I'll is. fix that, Greg. I, I wasn't. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. It's, it's it's my mistake. So Okay. But, but we'll clarify when we know. We don't know right now. Okay. Good, good enough. I'll watch for it then. Thank you. Yeah, so the reason um, uh, he's willing to talk on Tantra, which most uh, teachers uh, aren't, you know, immediately going to talk to is because he, he respects the work uh, we're doing here, uh, knowing that um, we're not trying to teach crazy Tantra. So uh, it really is an opportunity to ask very direct questions if he's willing to take questions. So that's why it's particularly uh, precious like that. Um, usually um, teachers are teaching to uh, publicly, they have to teach to very generic audience. Uh, so they have to kind of keep it kind of generic. So, uh, with the line store, people can uh, ask more specific questions, and uh, uh, and it's, he's willing to go into quite a bit of detail. I think people um, uh, uh, who've has teachings on Bardo, you know, quite a lot of detail actually. Um, so it feels like I'm going on and on, but. Um, because the majority of uh, students are, are new to Sacramento, um, we're not quite sure sometimes how to uh, approach teachers. I'm trying to be the teacher that you can learn from, but um, uh, something specifically like this, uh, where we get specific teaching from him or um, Arjun Rimshe is because, uh, I just have to say it was completely un-Tibetan, but it's because of me. So uh, take advantage of it. Uh, most people don't, you don't know a good teacher from a bad teacher because you haven't met enough teachers. But those people that have actually uh, spent some time among teachers, and I know Dirk and Jules have, then you, then you can get it, right? You go, okay, this is really, this is really a big deal. So, uh, you know, and I know Karen spent uh, many, times with Chodin Rinpoche, who's, you know, was living Buddha, really incredible. So uh, please take the opportunity and, uh, you know, follow through. I've always encouraged my students to meet with authentic teachers. So uh, even the people right here may, met with Dalai Lama and uh, incredible teachers recently. Um, uh, uh, we, we heard that maybe uh, Jada Rinpoche will come back uh, this fall, so uh, don't miss that. So if anything I could change, I would spend more time with my teacher. If anything I could change. I wouldn't change what I look like or the accidents I've had or the money I've lost or anything. Love my kids. Everything's perfect. Everything's perfect. I'd only change one thing. You heard me say it tonight. I would spend more time with my teacher when I was when he was alive. So don't waste your time, please. Thank you so much for today. Omaha. <laughs> yeah, very good. 